So welcome everyone to Plant Factory, uh, create and refine high quality 3D plants. And this is presented by Daniel Seebacker. This is part one of two. And this webinar is copyright Eon Software and Digital Art Live. And hopefully everyone now can see Daniel's shared screen. So let us know if you can see that. Uh, we only need a couple of um, confirmations in the chat box so let me know a couple of people that you can see Daniel screen I can anyone else yeah fantastic yep. okay, okay. I, let's make a start great thank you Daniel. so thank you Paul um, hi everyone I'm really excited to be here today and seeing so many both familiar and unfamiliar faces is pretty exciting um, Welcome to this webinar on Plant Factory 2016. Um, I promise you're not going to see much of a PowerPoint presentation today, but I just wanted to go to some introductory topics to get you started on what to expect today. Um, so as Paul said, uh, just enter your questions in the check box. He will keep track of them for me in case I get carried away with, with <laughs> presenting and there will be lots of uh, time for questions in between the several sections. So just a couple of words about myself. So my name is Daniel and I'm located in Munich, um, Upper Bavaria, Bavaria Germany. And um, in real life, I'm not doing 3D for a living. In fact, I work in the publishing industry. I am a trained bookseller and I study publishing um, at the Ludwig Maximilians University in, in, in Munich. And I work at one of Germany's biggest self-publishing platforms uh, for self-publishing authors as an author relations manager. So ebooks are my da daily business. And but I'm also a freelance 3D artist and my uh, strength lies in uh, all stuff that has to do with nodes and node based structures. So Plan Factory um, yeah, was a software that I really had a lot of fun getting into. And I've worked more than 12 years uh, with both Woo and of course Plan Factory um, since the first version was introduced in I believe 2014. And I also uh, have delivered a couple of presets and some content um, to both VU and TPF so far. Yeah, so what can you expect today from um, this first session? I would like to yeah, go through this introduction. Then we are going to explore the interface. Afterwards, I'm going to show you how you can um, draw plants and how to manip manipulate the plants that you just created with the gizmos in 3D. I will also mention a couple of very useful features with uh, this kind of manual edition, also quite um, a few very well hidden features. Then we will turn to fully procedural modeling and we're going to build a simple grass plant so that you can get a feeling for how you can create stuff from scratch with nodes. And finally, we will um, discuss how you can export the plants to both um, other DCC software. Um, I'm, I have Cinema 4D, so we're going to do um, one export example for Cinema 4D. And we're also discussing the integration to Vue um, and also to other applications such as game engines. And as I said, you will all have the um, option to raise your questions at any time and we will have several question answer slots in between. And in the end, I'm going to tell you what you can expect from tomorrow's session, which is going to build upon the knowledge that we learned today. So to sum up the introduction, I just want to mention a couple of things about Plan Factory as a software, what it can do and what it really is. So Plan Factory is a procedural modeling software that can do, of course, all kinds of plants, but also other objects that have sort of recursive geometry. For example, um, one of uh, the very talented uh, guys in the Vue Gallery groups, his name is Benny, does amazing uh, organic objects with uh, TPF, um, for example, a chain. Um, you can generate unlimited variations of the plant that you build. 
and you can also build models that can be controlled uh, with sliders for age, health or season. So you can build a plant that is five years old and is currently dying and it's uh, in fall, for example. Of course, all plants can be animated with wind and breeze. This is something that we're going to cover tomorrow. And um, just for all the people that come from VU, um, the great difference between Plant Factory and the Plant Editor in VU, uh, which is called the Botanica module, is that with TPF you can generate geometry totally from scratch and you can make it as complex or as simple as you like. And with uh, the built-in plant editor in VU, all you can do is edit pre-existing geometry, but you cannot create something entirely new. And TPF, of course, integrates with VU, but it also integrates with uh, all the other major 3D applications such as 3ds Max, Maya, Cinema 4D, and of course also game engines, e.g. Unity or the Unreal Engine. There are various export formats and we're going to have a look at export at the end of this session today. And also you have um, full control over everything in your plan. This includes the meshing options, so you can really control whether you want your plan to, to consist of quad geometry or triangles or both. Um, there's, uh, there are dedicated um, options for uh, plans that are going to be used in real-time applications such as games versus offline rendering. Um, there are ways to create various level of details and you can control even each individual plant part, so every leaf or every twig or every petal. Yes, it can export in quartz wain. And yeah, so your feedback is important and ask questions in the chat all the time. And also tell me what you like to see. Um, I have this outline set, but I can strive left or right depending on whether you're interested in one particular topic. Okay, so I'd say let's get started with TPF. So this is the startup screen in TPF. We're just going to start with an empty scene. So the first thing that we're going to do now is explore the interface. TPF um, is fully customizable in its workspace. So what you can see here in the beginning is the so-called basic workspace. We're going to switch between the basic and the advanced workspace throughout the two sessions. And just to show you what you can do, you can go to display, workspace and switch between the advanced and the basic workspace. So both workspaces are just suggestions on how to lay out um, all the different kinds of panels and editors. You can unlock the workspace at any time by right clicking on any of the tabs uh, names. And then you can move all the windows freely around and resize them as you see fit. And you can also save your layout as a new workspace. So let's get back to the basic workspace for a minute. Um, I'm going to explain the toolbars and the panels throughout um, the uh, session. One important thing that I would like to mention right at the beginning are the options which are found under File Options. Here you set the um, unit for your scene. So for example, if you're working on a tree, it might sense to work in meters or um, yards or feet. Um, but if you're working on a small flower, it's probably better to switch to centimeters because all the settings inside um, Plant Factory use physical units and uh, they use the units that you specify here. Also, if you don't like the interface, you can also um, customize the interface colors as well. And if you go to the Operations tab, there is a nice overview of all the different commands that the software has and you can assign keyboard shortcuts to them and always look up the shortcuts if you need them. So yeah, then I'd say let's get started with drawing plans. So on the left um, you have the drawing and manipulation toolbar. By default when you start TPF um, the drawing tool is already selected and the cursor looks like a small brush icon and you can click anywhere in the 3D preview and hold the left mouse button and then you can draw 
a part of a plant and the part will follow um, the, uh, the curve that you um, yeah just created with your cursor. Um, just as a notice, uh, if this looks a little bit laggy to you or not fluid enough, it's only because of the upstream of the webinar. It's totally fluid and smooth on your own machine, so I hope um, that it's also fluid on your screens right now. So once you uh, have drawn a part, you can um, move your cursor over the uh, part that you just drew, in this case a trunk, and the cursor will turn green. This indicates, uh, this line indicates the direction in which the next part that you're going to draw will be drawn. So TPF is pretty smart. If I draw another part, it's going to create a branch automatically. And I can simply continue drawing a couple of branches. And there we are. Okay, so let's assume I'm satisfied with the basic shape that I drew. I can now switch to the gizmo tool, which is the touch-up tool. And with this tool I can now select any instance or any single part of the tree that I just drew. And I can now go and manipulate this part of the tree. So through every part that you draw um, there's an axis that's running through and this axis is defined by tangent points. TPF automatically generates a certain number of points per axis so it all depends on the shape that you draw and you can hold down control on your keyboard and click anywhere else or sorry it's shift not control shift and now you can create additional points and if you uh, keep holding down shift and click again on a point you can delete it again. So by adding these points you have a lot of um, yeah anchors to manipulate the shape of your trunk in this case. So you can freely move the shape around and make the trunk a lot more gnarly. As you can see, I'm rotating around the trunk so that I can move the points in different orthogonal planes. Rotating, by the way, is done with the right mouse button. Zooming is done with the mouse wheel. And panning is done by holding down shift and moving the right mouse button around the scene. And um, if you click this icon here, the view will always reset on the entire plant. So that's a quick way to reset your camera. Um, also, the um, navigation shortcuts that I just told you depend on what uh, you have selected in the options. So I'm using the Plant Factory 2014.6 um, shortcut preset um, because I don't like the changes that were made in later versions for camera navigation. So um, yeah, it's totally up to you how you want to configure your navigation. Um, okay, so this is how you manipulate the axis of a tree and reshape it. And this is an error message that I will explain later. Um, as you can see, one of the trunks just turned yellow. Um, okay, N now the, the error is already resolved. Great. Um, so if you click on... Um, any child instance. So a child is something that grows out of another part of the geometry. So in this case the branches are the uh, the children of the trunk and the trunk is the parent of the branch. And if you click on a child geometry you get these gizmo handles which allow you to rotate sorry, which allow you to rotate the um, child around the corresponding axes. So it's pretty easy to place them at a specific place in uh, along, along the tree. And the blue handle can also be used to extend the length. The, the square in the middle can be used to increase the, uh, the radius of the child. 
you simply click into the rectangle and drag and draw your mouse to increase or decrease the radius. And finally, with the arrow, you can move um, a child instance up and down along the axis of the parent. You can also switch to the uh, pruning tool and cut off um, a part of a child. So let's click here, for example. And now the length is automatically reduced and we simply deleted everything that was on here. Um, yes, you can use two monitors actually. Um, since the uh, workspace is configurable in a very flexible manner, you can undock any panel and move it to a second screen. This will make the workspace definitely less cluttered. Okay, so um, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, these buttons up here allow you to decrease or increase the polygon resolution of your plant automatically. So right now the bottom of the plant is very crude. Um, it's very uh, low polygon, very angular. So let's take a look at what's going to happen when we say subdivide the plant more. Let's click it another time. Yes, so that's what it looks like now that I subdivide the plant three times. And by clicking this information button, you can also see the amount of polygons and the amount of yeah, parts that your plant consists of. Currently, we have four branches and one um, trunk. So we have five primitives and about 55,000 polygons. Um, the bone counter is used for um, animating the plant with wind and you can preview wind animation by clicking this icon and then the plant's going to start moving uh, in the wind. Right now no wind has been defined so the movement is there but it's very very subtle. As I said we will get into wind animation in more detail tomorrow. Okay and with these buttons you can do a render of your current screen or camera view. Ah, okay, yep. We don't want to show the post render options every time. And uh, once you did um, your first render this icon becomes active and it allows you to um, display a, a window of all your recently created renders or or rather the last render and with this area you can um, make um, a render of a selected area so let's just re-render the top part yes there we are okay let's turn that one off again Okay, and now the cool thing about Plant Factory is, as I said, that you can create an arbitrary amount of variations. So the things that we just drew already ha uh, should have built-in variations. And by clicking this icon with the dice, we can create a new variation of our plant. So the variations are very subtle at the moment. Um, we will build our own variations later on but uh, just so that you already know where to create a new plant. And these are just the copy and cut and paste buttons. You can also move the sunlight or the, the global light around in the scene by using the circle or, or sphere up here. So this represents the angle of the sun. Once we switch to the advanced workspace, there will be um, a lot more buttons that we will explore later. Okay, so um, one thing that I would like to point out is we just drew without selecting which part to draw. So all we did was um, select the draw tool, click anywhere and TPF automatically decided what to draw. But there are also drawing presets on the left hand side in this toolbar. So for example, if we would like to draw um, a branch, then we can select this icon and um, this is a preview, the component browser, which shows which kind of um, element is going to be drawn once we click with the brush cursor. So just 
take a look at this component browser while I click through the different icons. And you can um, already see um, that we uh, have different kinds of brushes, for example, palm leaf. So let's draw a palm leaf. Yep. So these are basically just presets for you. So when you quickly want to draw something, you don't have to start totally from scratch. You can use one of these um, existing presets and then modify these presets to fit them to your liking. Are there any questions so far? Yeah, there's a couple of questions in the chat box. So uh, we mentioned about exporting in quants a bit earlier. And uh, Nia said, what is the advantage to exporting quads or triangles? Um, as far as I know, a, a couple of game engines don't work well with quad meshing. So in this case, you need to export things uh, with triangles. But if you're not going to use the tree for um, a real-time application, but rather for offline rendering, then uh, I'd suggest uh, using quads because it's easier to take the tree into another software and you have clean topology then. And you can also then um, sculpt the tree a lot easier. There's also um, a mixture um, mode that uses both quads and triangles. So we will uh, dive into all of that tomorrow when we explore the meshing modes. But it's totally up to you what you want to use. So the options are all there. So this might be outside the scope of the webinar, uh, but it, uh, Mark W says, how does Plant Factory compare with Speed Tree? Um, to be honest, I've only used the demo version of Speed Tree, so I might not it might not be fair for me to compare both things. Um, as it stands, Speedtree has a lot of features that are there out of the box and TPF can do a lot of the same stuff and even more, but you have to build them uh, on your own with node networks. So, um, for example, you can make plants grow on objects, uh, which is also something that Speedtree can do, but you need to activate these options all, all by yourself and there's no single grow an object feature that you can use. So with TPF, you get a more um, granular approach. Um, the software lays out all the possibilities and options for you and it's up to you how you combine different nodes and logics and dependencies to create uh, great features and presets on your own. Um, there are quite a few things um, in TPF that uh, Speedtree cannot do, in my opinion, which um, is all about creating very intricate dependencies. For example, leaves that curl um, depending on um, the diameter of the parent branch, for example. Um, and other stuff, uh, for, um, such as iteration nodes, which we will also explore tomorrow, they present an alternative approach to plant modeling. Um, there are also a couple of things that Plant Factory doesn't have that Speedtree has, um, though. For example, um, uh, the mesh forces. So in Speedtree, I think you can uh, import a mesh, for example, a sphere, and can make the plant either um, attract to this mesh or avoid this mesh uh, while, it while it grows. And that's something that's not possible in Plant Factory yet. So okay. let's that's see really cool whether 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 that changes in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so that's all I know about the comparison between uh, TPF and Speedtree. <laughs> okay, thanks for the question, Mark. Um, and then we've got Nia asking, I'm not sure if this will be covered later. Uh, if so, then we will. Um, for save species for view, um, as FX said, is better to set 0, 0,1 TPF unit is one meter, is that right? Um, I'm not sure why Nicholas Pellegrino suggests uh, suggests this. Um, generally speaking, older versions of VU um, prior to version 9 used um, 0 0.1 meters for 1 um, meter in VU. But this changed with uh, version 9. And since then, the default setting has always been 1 um, unit is 1 meter. And uh, so... In general, you should you 
can export it with a 0 0.1 um, as a unit size, but in either either way, you should um, make sure that your units in Vue match. I'm not not entirely sure how well the automatic rescaling works. If you land uh, load a plant in Vue that's been saved with another um, unit than your current scene. So um, yeah, Nicholas says you can rescale it uh, in Vue. I'm not sure why he suggests this, um, I, but that's a pretty good question. Um, I'm going to ask him. <laughs> as simple as that. I'd say stick to one for one meter because I've had only good experiences with it and it makes scale conversion pretty easy. Now, this question might be answered by you know, g going to the comparison area on the Plant Factory website, you know, between the different versions. But Jason W says, do you know the limitations of TPF artist? I'm not seeing some of the same functions on the left side of the screen. Mm. Um, I don't have the comparison table in front of me, to be honest. Mer maybe Barry can say more about this. Yeah, or drop the link into the chat box. I think that might be mm. a good idea. I, I, I do have a couple. I, I know a couple of things um, uh, from the top of my head. Um, for one, with artist, you are limited to using pre-made plant parts from um, the library that ships with TPF. So uh, y I think you cannot create your own geometry from scratch. You need to load something pre-existing and modify this. Um, as uh, also, you cannot create plants with age, health, and season. And everything that we're going to do in the later part of the session, which is using the graph here, is not possible with designer, uh, with artist. Sorry. Well, thanks, Barry. Thanks for the link. My pleasure. All right, we're 30 minutes into the webinar, uh, maybe just under. Yep. So uh, let's carry yep. on. Yeah. Okay. So um, you can also use. Um, these components for uh, drawing a tree. Let's create a new scene, a new empty one. And you're not limited to these node presets. You can click this button and this will open up a library that of several components that ships with uh, Plant Factory. And so these are organized in, into different categories. And let's say I would like to create this trunk. I'm simply going to load it and I can now either draw it as we did before with the cursor or I can um, click the plus sign to add it to the graph. In this case it's going to be added um, as a straight uh, part but I can still go into tweaking mode and deform the trunk if I want to. Now let's say I'd like to add um, a couple of branches so let's go into the branches category maybe this one and click the plus sign once again and there we are we already have a pretty nice looking plant with um, a lot of branches and finally um, what's still missing are the leaves so let's just use these ones click plus again and there we are we created a tree with three mouse clicks so uh, the leaves that you're uh, currently seeing are billboards. Um, if I move the camera slowly, you can see the leaves always turning and facing the camera. Um, so this works pretty well in, in Vue for ecosystems in the distance, for example. Um, it's not so well suited for other applications, though. Um, but TPF offers five different types of uh, leaf geometry. So you do have the option to use these flat billboards. You can also use single leaves um, that consist of a flat plane. You can use curved planes which are called warp boards. You can use real 3D geometry that you're going to model with a dedicated node, so with real depth. And you can also use external meshes from other applications that you modeled, um, for example in Maya, and you can simply load them into uh, Plant Factory to use them for your leaves. And we will explore all these different kinds of leaves during um, the two webinars. Okay, so I'd say it's time to switch to the advanced workspace. Yes. 
So I'd like to point out a few things before we really um, dig deeper. Every plant part that we just created is represented in here. This is the plant graph. So um, a graph is basically the the um, plan for the plant, how it's being built from which parts. And um, we have a trunk, we have the branches, and we have the leaves. And uh, when I select any of these things, the corresponding plant part has been highlighted in red. You can turn off the highlighting um, by clicking this button, but I'll leave it on for the time being. Okay, so um, before we dig deeper, let's adjust the view options because these are the default options that TPF 2016 um, starts with and there have also been a couple of changes since version 2014 and 2015. And so let's go to the view panel and let's go to um, graph and first let's enable the advanced menu. This allows you to do a right click and get a list of all the nodes, which is pretty convenient. The second thing you should do as a new user is um, to go to Graph Node Display Options and say Show Control Nodes. TPF ships with a lot of um, sample scenes and tutorial content and you will not be able to see all of the nodes in the tutorial scenes if this is unchecked. So um, you should definitely enable it. and. I also like to um, disable display nodes minimized and let's also go to uh, show geometry specific nodes. Yes. Okay, so you can see that um, unchecking these options added two new um, formerly hidden nodes to the graph, uh, which we'll explore tomorrow. And uh, it also unfolded the minimized notes. You can fold and unfold a note by double clicking on it, and then you get the full name. And by double clicking again, you can minimize it. If you click, uh, if you do a double click on the name, you can rename uh, this part of the note. So every plant part starts at the root. Um, this is the the origin of the scene. So the ground plane here at the bottom. And um, this is where the plant always starts to grow, in the middle of the ground. And um, this graph represents, um, yeah, the hierarchy of your plant. So this is the parent, this is the child, and this is another child, so it's the grandchild to this trunk. And um, I'd like to point out um, that you can disable specific um, notes by clicking this icon so they will simply not be computed and they are removed from the view and by clicking it again they are computed again. Um, you can also disable specific uh, types of geometry for example you can hide all branches which includes the trunk as well so we're only left with the leaves or you can disable um, billboards only but um, stick with all the other types of leaf geometry with uh, all the other four types. Okay, and um, in the advanced view we also have the wireframe. So let's hide um, the leaves again. And here we can see the wireframe of our plant. It's a little hard to see at the moment um, because the texture is so dark. So when I select the trunk it should be easier. Yes, so these are the lines of the quad geometry. And one of the very, very cool things is that you can, can combine um, this manual edition with the gizmos and um, the procedural edition within um, the graph. So let me give you an example. Um, I'm going to switch to the um, gizmo tool, which is now up here. And I'm going to select one of the branches. Now let's extend the length of only this single branch. And there we are. So um, let me just ungroup this. So um, 
these uh, pre-made uh, brushes that we used earlier are grouped nodes. So you can build your own brushes simply by grouping them. So I just ungrouped uh, the, the brush, the component to see its insides. And now I can directly see the settings of these nodes. So let's select um, this child again that I just made longer. Uh, if we look down here, we can see all of the settings um, that we can use to shape our um, plant. So right here, uh, it says variation one. So by editing this plant part, we just created a variation of all of the branches that grow out of our trunk. And um, the only difference to all the other variations is that this part is longer. So you can see this here, um, we extended it to a length of 12 meters. And if I go back to five meters, for example, we made it shorter. So every addition that you make in here with individual plant parts is reflected in the settings um, of the node. And by uh, selecting the corresponding child, you, um, TPF automatically switches to a corresponding variation. You can also do this manually when I deselect this and select the node again, all of the branches will be selected and the drop down menu says all primitive instances. I can now go and manually select the variation that I just made. And if I don't like the variation, I can r do a right click on, on the name of the setting and say revert. And this deletes the variation, it's gone now and the plant uh, now has the same settings um, uh, uh, just like all the other child uh, children and the setting that was defined in this branch component node. Okay, so um, basically let's start now with um, a new scene. Okay, before we're going to build um, our grass plant, I'd like to um, mention uh, two more uh, pretty cool features. So let's add a trunk to the scene. Um, in this case, I'm going to do a right click so that I'm not um, activating the drawing tool, but rather adding the preset to the graph automatically. Hey, so this added a trunk. So now I'm manipulating the um, geometry um, by editing the settings of this trunk node. So you can think of a node as a building block for your um, plant. So it's a totally different approach than traditional modeling where you'd use um, extrude commands and do cuts with knife, etc. So this is all done through entering settings in here. So let's um, increase the radius from uh, 50 centimeters, so half a meter to one meters, for example. And let's increase the resolution so that we can see the trunk a little bit more clearly. Okay, so let's assume this is a basic geometry that we would now uh, like to export to another application for sculpting. If you have ZBrush installed on your machine, which I don't, you can uh, do a right click in the graph view and select send selected primitive to ZBrush. This will um, open ZBrush on your machine and it's using the GeoZ uh, link, the go to ZBrush link, and you can directly um, sculpt this geometry in ZBrush, for example, press the um, GeoZ button there and the sculpt will turn up uh, in Plant Factory. Um, of course, if you have another sculpting application, um, you can use that one as well. And I'm going to show you how. So when you edit um, a trunk, which is um, a modified preset of this advanced segment node, which is the most common node when building plants, um, you have the option to select um, the uh, how this node should work. So by default, all the shapes settings of um, this part of the geometry are created in TPF. But if you change the skin feature to imported geometry, you can now load 
an externally created geometry that should make up the plant. So in this case, I er exported the trunk earlier into Cinema 4D. And I sculpted it in there. I'm a horrible sculptor. I have no experience with sculpting, so please just ignore the results. It's more a demonstration of the idea. And I exported the sculpt as an OBJ. And now let's import the sculpt into TPF. And there it is. So it's really easy to create a base uh, mesh um, in TPF then export it for sculpting to another, another application. And the real, really great thing is that you now still have the flexibility to edit the length and the diameter of this mesh, mesh that you just created. So the sculpt is basically being used as a hull for the axis. So let's um, display the axis, for example, of uh, that trunk. So I'll uh, add another control point. And now I can still deform the trunk however I like. And it's using the, the sculpted skin. And we can increase the radius, for example, to 2. Make it a really big and gnarly trunk and decrease the length to 2. Yes, so you retain all the flexibility within TPF um, with the benefits of sculpting a high resolution tree. And um, we'll start with our grass plant uh, within a couple of minutes. There's one last thing that I would like to show you. Um, as I said, all of these nodes are basically modified presets of uh, these nodes, the, um, the um, advanced segment. So this time, let's start with an advanced segment. And this is going to add the very basic geometry to our scene that um, Plant Factory uses for the creation of the plant, and that is a cylinder. Um, currently, the polygon count is pretty high. It's uh, 35,000, so let's reduce and unsubdivide the plant a little bit so that it's back to 560. Yeah, that looks better. Um, yes, TPF can automatically deal with a uh, level of details and we'll go into the creation of level um, of details tomorrow. Um, but if you switch to the um, select tool, you can already see that uh, we have um, by default five levels of details activated and you can switch through each level of detail uh, by clicking the corresponding star you can already see how the plant is going to be unsubdivided and the lower we get. And if you turn on auto, the level of detail will automatically switch depending on the distance of the camera in the viewport. And tomorrow we'll explore more in detail how you can manipulate these level of details and how you can create them on your own. You're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, so um, what I wanted to show you was that um, you can make the plant vary in Plant Factory pretty easily. If you hover with your mouse over any of the settings, you will notice a second numerical field. In between these two fields are a tiny plus and minus. So this indicates the variation. Um, so right now the cylinder has a length of 10 meters because we're working in meters in, in the scene once again to be set in the file options menu and if I now say 10 plus minus 3 the length of um, that cylinder will randomly be uh, chosen between 7 and 13 meters so by adding a variation to a lot of settings you can um, add quite a lot of um, unique variation to our plant species while keeping the overall characteristics so let's do that with a couple of settings um, let's change the radius to uh, user-defined so that we can set it in a physical unit. So currently it's set to one meter, that's a little bit too much. Let's set it to uh, 75 centimeters plus minus 30 centimeters. And maybe let's 
go to the influences tab and add a little um, perturbation to the cylinder so this will um, actually um, uh, distort the uh, axis inside the cylinder and um, let's say 0.5 plus minus yeah 0.5 maybe and now by clicking the um, new plant variation button TPF will choose between uh, these three settings that we just entered and this will generate a new tree part on the fly and something that's new in TPF 2016 is this button let's say you like a particular variation of your plant you can then save this variation by clicking this button this flag the variation if you do a right click you get a new panel of all the currently flagged variations let's uh, create another one and flag this one as well and let's create a third one and flag this one as well <clears throat> and now we have three variations of our plant that we can always um, load by clicking on the thumbnails and the cool thing is that these variations when you work uh, inside Vue will be accessible in Vue as well both in ecosystems and when you um, load the plant as a single plant and edit it with the plant editor so I think that's a pretty cool feature and um, allows yeah basically to select the the kind of variations that um, are going to be used in an ecosystem in Vue and uh, generally speaking um, as long as we are in this tab the parameters tab we will see all of the settings that relate to this type of geometry and these settings up here are all about global options for the plant for example on the meshing tab we can select between the different meshing modes which we will explore tomorrow and on the setup tab you can see the current seed of the plant so right now it's 3634 you can also generate a new um, variation by just entering a new seed and if I go back to 3634 we will get the same variation that we had before okay so um, next up we're going to model our first real plant which is going to be a very simple grass type before we start doing this are there any questions there was one previous question from mark w on how does plant factory deal with hdr now is that something we're going to deal with later or is that something you can answer now um well plant factory doesn't really deal with hdr um it's not really made for rendering. You can do a render of your plant as I showed you earlier. Um, the producer version and only the producer version has the option to display the atmosphere editor um, that uh, you probably know as a Vue user. So by going to display atmosphere editor, you um, get the uh, editor for editing the atmosphere. And um, you can switch the atmosphere type uh, from photometric spectral to or standard spectral to environment mapping and if you do this TPF will will ask you whether it should automatic, ma automatically adjust all the settings um, you should say yes and um, you can now go to the effects tab and load an HDRI map um, into the slot and this HDRI map will then be used for um, lighting your scene when rendering um, a preview inside um, the 3D camera view. So yes, uh, TPF can deal with HDRIs, but um, yeah, it's not really its main purpose. So I'll just go back to the default spectral. Yeah, we've lost, um, we've lost your audio. Uh, Dan, what I would recommend you to do is to exit the room and come back in again. See if you could do that quick. And then we'll probably recapture your uh, audio. So I'll just make a note on the time index so we can 
edit that little bit out. I'm back. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Okay. And I'm just going to re-promote you because uh, that's something I need to do again. So yeah, you've now um, re-promoted. So if you could share your screen again. Yep, just a second. Okay. Can you see the screen again? Yeah. Okay, so um, there's a couple, there's a couple of questions, uh, and just like B says, yes, it's, that adds to the thrill of the experience. <laughs> it sure oh, does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. I've got a couple of questions here. So, um, again, just let me know if you have want to deal with this now or later. So, Anthony asks, any advantages to modeling plants with procedural bees drawing them freestyle? Um, yes, you can only be so precise when you draw it um, with with your hand. Um, also, you have to keep in mind that the library that TPF ships with uh, regarding brushes, the components as they are called in TPF, is pretty limited. So um, if you want to draw something that isn't included in the software, uh, you will have to dive into procedural modeling. There's no way around it. So um, drawing is pretty good if you already have a library of brushes uh, that you can reuse for trunks, for branches or whatever that you built yourself and you now quickly want to create a hero tree um, that should uh, look exactly um, like, I don't know, um, something that your art director wants or something that resembles a, so a storyboard. So that's pretty uh, good but um, in all other aspects you should go with um, um, procedural modeling and the great thing is that you don't have to enter everything manually into these fields if you want to um, e um, change the length simply uh, change to the gizmo tool and um, increase the length and there it is now Wayne Martell asks could you just show how to get the text on the nodes again please mm-hmm so um, by double clicking on the node you can unfold it and uh, fold it again and by default when you start TPF for the first time the uh, preview settings for the graph are set to create nodes minimized and display nodes minimized. By unchecking uh, both of these you will circumvent the creation and display of nodes minimized from the very beginning. Okay, right, we're 55, about 55 minutes into the webinar now, just under. Uh, yep. Should we carry on? Um, are there any more questions? I see one can replace leaf with moss, for example. Um, yeah, it's totally up to you uh, what you want to create. So you can build uh, your own moss plant with uh, the nodes, and then you can save this moss plant out as a component, as a brush. So um, let me just do that. I'll simply do it with an example here. So let's connect the branch to this trunk. And now I'm going to select both nodes with my mouse and clicking this group icon. And we now group this into a meta node, which uh, Vue users might probably know from the function editor. And if I now, now save this node as a component, um, let's save it to the desktop. We'll name it test brush and save it. TPF suggests rendering um, a preview. A preview. Um, I don't care for that at the moment. Um, I can now go um, here to the component browser, click the load button, and let's just browse to the component that we just created and saved and load this. And I can now either edit with plus sign to uh, the scene or 
I can use the brush again and draw it. And that's what it looks like. So uh, with your uh, moss you can basically do the same thing. Create your moss with different nodes, save it out as a component and then you can load the entire moss to be reused on any plant with the single click of a button. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'd say it's uh, time for our uh, first real plant. So, um, I decided to do a very uh, simple grass uh, plant. So, um, let's get started with that one. So, I mentioned that there are different types of um, geometry that can be used in Plant Factory for the creation of leaves. And um, so, I uh, built this plant on purpose to demonstrate two different types of geometry while building this plant. And so we're going to start with the very top of the plant which contains a couple of seeds that look um, a little weed-like. Wheat -like. And uh, so for this case, in this case I want to use a geometry that um, creates a, f a plane that I can then bend um, and curve with a couple of settings. And this is the warp board. So um, let's just display the wireframe. You can see that the wire board consists of quite um, low polygons. So uh, it's a very um, lightweight node. And I'm going to set all the settings to zero for the beginning so that we can um, remodel them later, re-enter them later. Okay, so um, let's talk about materials for a moment. Um, in every node you have the materials group. Um, for more complex nodes such as the segment node there's um, a specific tab for the materials um, distribution but in this case the node has only a few settings so you can find it already on the front page. So by default um, every material every node is set to inherit its material from its parent. So um, in this case uh, we are going to connect the, uh, these s grass seeds later to the top of the stem and we don't want um, this uh, plane to inherit the texture of the stem. So let's create a new material. Let's go to new material and by double clicking in the material preview the material editor will open. So this is the same material editor that you have in Vue. However, there's a small difference. Um, the basic material editor in Vue looks different than in TPF. There's um, a reason for this. As long as you stay within the basic material editor, you only have very limited options. These options are loading textures um, into the color and uh, alpha slot, loading a bump or a normal map, and loading maybe a backlight or highlighting map into the slot and you can also adjust the highlights or specular lighting. And uh, this is what I'm going to do now. And the reason for these limited settings is that um, all of these settings can be exported to other applications. You can also switch to the advanced material editor and TPF will also issue a warning that you will now have options um, that cannot be exported, that will only work in Vue. And so, for example, you now have um, subsurface scattering, reflections, um, transparency, translucency, and all of the other things. And you can also create totally procedural materials that are made out of fractals and that are truly interactive and can, for example, be linked to the season of the plant so that you can change the hue of a texture map procedurally and a lot of those things. And these are all fantastic tools, but you cannot export them. They will only work within Vue. So let's get back to the basic material for this very reason. Okay, so let's use the... Um, um, let's load the color map. So I uh, scanned uh, the plant that I wanted to build um, yesterday evening and I already um, extracted the textures in Photoshop and so these are all ready to go. Um, so where are we there? Okay, 
So these are the seeds of the plant and TPF already recognizes that this is a PNG file with embedded alpha information and asks, asks me whether I'd like to use it as transparency or alpha. Let's say yes. Okay, and there is our texture, which is a little bit distorted at the moment, but we're going to fix this within a few seconds. I also created a bump map, uh, sorry, a normal map. So let's activate bump and switch to normal. And let's load the normal map for the grass. And since we're going to use this plant in Vue later on, let's increase the backlight also to 100%. Okay, and I'm going to switch back to the advanced material editor so that I can rename the material to grass seeds, for example. Okay, so um, the uh, texture mapping options for a single plane are very limited, obviously. So there are no UV um, settings that you can edit here. Um, the texture is always uh, uh, fully mapped onto um, that plane. So in order to undistort uh, this texture, we need to change the width and the length of the plane. So um, thinking about the measurements that I did when I um, scanned the plant, uh, the real plant was about four centimeters in width. So let's change the width to four. And the length was about 25 centimeters. And I just noticed that we still need to switch to centimeters. We're currently working in meters, which is a little bit, bit too big for a plant. So let's go to the options and switch to centimeters. Yeah, that looks better. Okay, so this is what our texture looks like now. Um, that's better. And now I would like to bend this flat polygon plane so that it gets a little more depth. So for bending, we have two settings, curl and flexibility. So let's try a value of two for curl. Let's turn off the wireframe. Okay, not too bad. And let's add a little bit of variation, maybe 50%, point five. And let's also use flexibility to Band the plant, um, maybe 0 0.3, plus minus, oh, let's take uh, 0 0.7. So you might be wondering what's going to happen if we go into a negative range now that I entered um, 0 0.7. Um, the preview here always shows you with an orange line the mean or intermediate value between the two things that you enter here. And um, these uh, two areas represent the positive and the negative range that um, the plant setting can go into. So by going into negative, um, we simply reverse the bending direction. So if I decrease this to minus and minus, you can see that we just reversed the direction of the bending. So let's undo that. Okay, so we already created the top of our um, plant, of our grass plant. So I saw there is a material question, I'll just read it. Um, since I work uh, the most in VU, I always use um, PNGs um, from Photoshop. Um, yes, I use the export for web feature. Um, but for other applications, I'd rather suggest um, using separate maps for um, the alpha map, for the alpha channel and the diffuse channel, because there can be differences, for example, wide fringes, um, if PNGs are interpreted differently by every application. So splitting these um, two maps into two separate TIFF files is what I'd recommend if you want to use the plant in another application. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to rename this um, grass seeds. And next up, let's create our stem. 
So for the moment we are done with this part of the plan and we don't need to see it so I'll simply click onto the connection line and press delete and the plan part disappears for the time being. Um, now we're going to add a stem and for this we will start with an advanced segment because this provides us with a cylinder that we can now shape into what we need. So this is what our cylinder looks like and first let's adjust the length. So I think the plant had about 50 centimeters in length and let's add some variation to it, maybe plus minus 10 centimeters. Um, so the radius is something that we're going to adjust soon. Um, for now, before we uh, create this, uh, we, before we shape the stem any further, let's now connect the seed to the segment. I'll rename this stem. Okay, so now um, we have a new tab, so we just connected both nodes and in the parent, so in the stem, we now have a new tab which is called a children tab because it controls how many copies or instances of this node will grow out of the parent. So by going to this tab we can now influence where these copies will grow out, in which um, direction, which angle, etc. So, as I said, these seeds are going to be um, the top of our plant. So, let's go to the placement group and change the placement from uh, um, start from axis of the segment to tip of the segment. And this just moved the removed all the the children from the side of the stem and created a single child on the tip of the segment. The angle is a little bit awkward because it's not pointing up. This is due to the angle that's entered in here, which is 30 degrees. So let's reset this to zero and we what we end up with is a nice um, yeah, seat head <laughs> for the top of our grass, for the lack of a better <laughs> English term. <laughs> um, so Let's zoom in a bit and now we can see that we definitely need to decrease the radius of our stem because it's way too thick compared to our texture. Um, I just realized that I forgot a, uh, one thing uh, while we were setting up this texture. So let's get back into the material editor. Um, you can see that there is a little tiny icon, a leaf icon here and a leaf icon there. It's the same icon so you can um, access this function from both places in the application. So let's click on this icon and this defines the hooking point. This looks a little bit um, awful at the moment because <laughs> it's a PNG file with transparency so that's simply the way that the alpha channel looks like. Um, with the hooking point we can define where the children uh, connect uh, connect uh, with the parent. So we want the um, the texture or the seed uh, node to be placed exactly, um, yeah, at this point uh, with our parent. So let's move the connection point up here. Click OK, and now we can see that our connection just shifted into the middle of the cylinder. So now we have a perfect match. So the next step is to go back to the stem and reduce the radius to make it fit with our um, grass seeds texture. So let's change the radius to user defined and let's decrease it until it sort of fits. Um, mm. You can already see that the resolution is pretty low. We get a rectangular um, stem so let's subdivide the stem a little more so that we can better judge when to stop with the radius decre um, decreasing. Yeah I think that one looks pretty good to me. Um, it's not matching exactly though. Um, the 
um, the the seats are a little bit offset to the left um, because the texture was not placed entirely in the middle in Photoshop. Um, so we can either fix this by going back into uh, this window here, but um, it's really hard to move the point around in this tiny window. So I would like to, um, instead of offsetting the texture, um, I would like to offset the entire node. So let's go to the transform tab where we can um, enter uh, offset no uh, values. And I would like to offset the uh, this a um, little bit by maybe 0 0.1. Uh, maybe 0 0.2 and that looks better to me. It's still not perfect but since the plant's going to be viewed from so far away um, I think we can deal with uh, uh, with uh, this small uh, discrepancy. Okay so um, the next thing is to influence the radius because we're going to cheat and use this flat texture map instead of real 3D geometry. Um, I would like the uh, radius of that cylinder to um, uh, decrease qu uh, quite a lot um, to the very uh, top. So um, there are now actually two ways uh, how you can accomplish this. Um, I'm going to show you the lesser used one because it fits the situation um, better and I can also talk about this feature by showing this to you. So here we have um, a couple of icons that open up dedicated editors. So I would like to edit the section of the cylinder. So let's click on this icon and what we end up with is um, a representation of our current geometry of this cylinder and we can now divide this cylinder into different parts and uh, use these spline points to deform these parts. I'll show you uh, to you what that looks like. So um, let's first click anywhere with the left mouse button onto the cylinder and this will add um, yeah a point of subdivision. And I will um, add another circle and move this to the very, very uh, top of the geometry. And now let's make this a little bit more flat. So you can already see what's going to happen. By left clicking anywhere I can add new points and I can now make the this um, yeah uh, thinner at the very top. So since you always work with tangents, it's not per, uh, possible to get that perfect rectangular thin shape. Um, but I think that's still okay. So let's click OK, and it seemed to work. However. Um, I now realize that we need to uh, rotate our top grass seat by 90 degrees so that it matches the shape that we just created. So let's go back to the grass seats into rotation angles and let's rotate it around the c-axis by 90 degrees and we also need to offset it a little bit maybe by 0.0, .0 Zero 0.5, no, 0 0.8. Ah, okay, sorry. Since we rotated this by 90 degrees, we need to move this offset um, from X to Y. Yes, and now we got a match. Okay, um, I think I'll go back to uh, this editor in the meantime. I click again and let's just m move this a little bit more upwards. Uh, we can see that uh, it gets uh, still gets thinner um, around here and I really only want the top I don't know f um, 0.5 centimeters to get thinner so let's move that 
up even further something like this yes that looks good to me okay so now we have our stem any questions so far just to mention from sylvie like the way that you go from leaf to stem it's easier to see how to get each node together yeah that's um i think depend dependent on the plant um for this plant i thought i'd start with the top because i knew that the top was going to be a two-dimensional texture and um, i wanted to be able to match the um, connected geometry to the two-dimensional texture so um, yeah I think you have to find your own workflow for each plant and um, it's always a good idea to start with the smaller details um, and then connect them to the larger picture um, so because it's harder once you have for example an entire tree with um, an elaborate branching structure it's harder to zoom in on the individual leaf so in this case I'd probably go with the leaf first Thanks, Christian. <laughs> um, okay, if there are no further questions, I'm going to continue. I think we're good in time. Okay, so next, um, let's set up the material for our um, stem. So in this case, uh, we have uh, an, a separate material tab. Um, because with a more complex geometry, such as this one, um, we can influence the UV mapping um, in detail and also add uh, more than one layer, uh, for example, a second material layer with separate UV coordinates. So that's why we have um, another tab and we can specify the material uh, for the body of the, the geometry and we can also specify another material, for example, for the cap. Think of um, a tree uh, stump for example, that's been cut off. So it's easy to load a top, um, yeah, profile texture into here. So by default, all uh, parts, um, once again, inherit the texture from the parent. So let's go to the parent because this, uh, we're not going to add anything um, further uh, below our stem. So in this case, let's leave it like that and go to the parent, which is the root. And here in the root, we can see that uh, we have this default material. So uh, let's double click this material. It's also the same one as here and edit it. Once again, let's load a color map. And I already prepared one. Don't know why it says it has transparency because it hasn't. <laughs> Maybe because I saved it as a PNG file. And once again, let's load the normal map. that was the wrong one yeah that's the one and let's reset the highlight to white and reset it to 4 and 40 and we were not going to need backlighting because well it's a stem it's not a leaf so let's leave that at 0 and let's rename this in the advanced editor to stem and click OK and if we now zoom in, we can see that we have a pretty good match with our um, top texture. Um, we could probably um, move the, the top texture a little bit further down uh, by going in here and using a negative offset. So just in case, um, yeah, not really necessary, but I'd like to be on the safe side of things. So by zooming in, we can now see that the texture mapping looks pretty off. So let's go to the ba uh, back to the stem and check parametric. Parametric means that we can now influence how often the texture is going to be repeated. Um, otherwise, TPF is going to um, decide that for us. And this is what it looks like. <laughs> so let's check parametric. And now we can um, actually um, enter how often the texture is going to be tiled. 
so the texture itself is seamless, so I think around the circumference of the uh, cylinder I'd want to try a value of 4, and along the length let's try a v-tile of 3. Let's have a look. That looks better, maybe increase the v-tile to 4. Still a little stretched, let's try 6. Yeah, I think that's okay for a stem texture. The original texture is also um, not distorted, but yeah, it's it's uh, longer than wide, so I think the result looks okay. Um, yes, so this is our stem. Right now it's a straight line, so let's deform the axis of our of our stem and once again we could now go into um, the touch-up mode and deform the axis manually I need to zoom in a bit manually um, with the gizmo tools so for example like this um, or like this which is of course an, an extreme example However, the downside of this approach is that it's more difficult to get variation in uh, into the um, growth shape of of um, our stem. And so, what I'd like to do is to use another setting instead of using the gizmos. So, how we ca can we get uh, rid of um, that deformation that we just introduced? Well, as I said earlier, every change that you make in the 3D view is being reflected in uh, at least one of these settings here. And in this case, um, the this button is now clicked next to Axis. Let's click it. And what we can see here is a dedicated editor where it can also manipulate the axis of the plant instead of using that 3D uh, view um, separately on each three um, orthogonal planes. So let's just do an extreme example. Yeah, so this is what we just created. And if we want to get rid of what we did, let's do a right click and say reset. And this resets our um, internal axis to a straight spline again. So I'd like to use another setting that I showed you earlier before while we were toying around with the, uh, one of the segment nodes. And this is the axis perturbation. Basically, uh, the thing that is behind the axis perturbation is um, a built-in noise node, a fractal. Uh, for Vu users, it's um, a, a chipped fractal node in here. And I'd like to use um, a value of 0 0.5 plus minus 0.25. And um, the um, details are way too small, so we don't want to to uh, our stem to look like that. So by using the frequency setting, we can decrease um, the scaling of this um, perturbation. So to give you an example, let's try 0.7. You can already see that things are going to get bigger. And yeah, 0.1 looks good to me for, for a wild grass plant. Uh, also, um, since, our, since the top of our plant is bent um, the, the warp board, the grass seeds node, I would like to make sure that despite the dis uh, perturbation strength that we used, the tip of um, our stem should always remain at the top. And for this um, you have the setting make planar. Um, by the way, if I resize that window, make it a little bit smaller, um, the settings rearrange underneath each other and now we can read the full names. So by setting make planar to 1, um, I just um, constrained the perturbation to I think it was the x-axis and I made sure that the tip um, always stays up here and is not leaning to the left, down or uh, wherever. And finally um, I would like to show you, once again on the Influences tab, the biases. So the biases are um, forces that act upon 
um, the geometry. So these forces can be um, something like a magnet that draws the geometry into a specific direction or they can make the, the geometry twist for very gnarly and twisted trees. Um, or uh, in this case it can make the uh, geometry curl and that's what I would like to use right now so that we get a little bit of bending in, in the stem as well. So let's activate the local bias. Let's change the type to curl. And now I can specify the direction of the curl and I can um, decide whether I want to use world coordinates. So this would correspond to the directions of the gizmos that you see here. Um, Z is up, by the way, in VU and TPF. So uh, uh, Z is the up axis, not Y. Or whether I would use local coordinates. The difference being um, if this was not a stem but a branch that we are going to attach to a trunk, then of course the coordinate system would change because the gizmos would be rotated by 90 degrees. So you can switch between local or object and world coordinates. In this case, let's stick with world coordinates. And um, I would like to use a curl along the y axis. Oh, sorry, y is probably not the best idea. Let's try the x axis. Maybe minus x. Yeah, that looks better. And um, I would like uh, the the curl to be a relative. That means that TPF will um, automatically take the length of the segment into account and um, adjust the strength of the curl internally. Um, so if I uncheck this, um, the curl is a lot stronger. So let's uh, stick to the relative coordinates and um, I think that's way too strong but we can use um, a strength of 0 and plus minus 0 0.5 maybe yep so TPF will now randomly curl this backwards or uh, forwards maybe let's stick with positive after all. And now for these curves. If you're a speed tree user, these curves will probably look familiar to you. We will get into more details tomorrow with more elaborate projects, but for now I would still like um, to show you at least the orange curve. So let's do a right click and uh, say edit filter. I'll display the grid so that it's easier to get a view. Okay. So this is basically a curve editor that you that you uh, probably know from any other software. And the thing is that with the orange curves you can influ influence the strength of every setting along the height of the geometry. So in this case um, we can see one represents 100% uh, and 0% zero, zero and minus 1 of course reverses the direction. So um, we can see that the curl strength is the same everywhere along the height of the plant. It's 100% everywhere. So I would like uh, to uh, bend the plant randomly. Maybe let's bend the, the bottom a little bit, the middle not so much, and the top uh, a little more. So let's switch the curve type to a Bezier or a smooth curve. And by double clicking anywhere, maybe here, I'll simply create a random curve and this randomizes the strength of the curl along the length of the segment. So the left part of that filter curve represents um, the bottom, the very beginning of the geometry and the right part represents the top. So you could imagine that this curve is rotated, rotated 90 degrees to the left. And just to give you an idea how uh, how that influenced the plant, let's increase the curl to a very strong strength. And let's readjust the curve value. Uh, right now we're in the negative range, so we reversed it. Let's make it stronger. Let's remove the curviness here altogether. Here as well. And here as well, so to zero. And what we ended up with is just the upper part of the plant is now going to 
be curled. So this is what it looks like. I can also reverse this and now the beginning of the plant is being curled. And yeah, I hope you get the idea. So let's reset this to zero. And we are done with our stem. So all that's uh, missing for now are the leaves and then our grass plant is done. Are there any questions? Any questions on the, um, the finer details of working on the stem there? Nothing? Okay, otherwise, okay. We, otherwise we, we can carry on, but if you place any questions in the chat, we'll make sure that we'll get those answered for you. Okay, great. So let's move to, um, to the leaves finally and get this plant done. So um, for the leaves, I would like to show you how you can model a leaf uh, with real 3D geometry. So, so far all we uh, uh, saw of the five different types of geometry that TPF supports for leaves were the billboards in the very beginning and this bent polygon that called the warp board. Now it's time to model some leaves with real depth. So in order to do that we need another advanced segment. So I just edit this one and I'll rename this leaves. Okay, so um, you will notice um, once again that uh, if we go back to the stem parameter we just uh, got a new tab called leaves. And here we can once again specify where our leaves will grow from. We will do that later once our leaf is done. So let's get back to the leaf. Um, since a leaf is basically flat, we don't need the cylinder. So let's set the radius of that cylinder to zero. And instead we're going to activate blades. And uh, the blades group will now add another uh, flat plane to our geometry. However, the difference is this time that this geometry consists of lots of polygons, as you can see here. So we have a lot of um, resources to now shape this flat geometry into anything we want. So um, let's go to the blades tab. And here we are. So for the leaves, I'd like the leaves to vary between 6 and 10 centimeters. So let's use a length of 8 plus minus 2. And I'm also going to show you one slider on the transform tab, which is the mesh resolution boost. So with these settings here, we can subdivide or unsubdivide the entire plant at once. But what if I simply want to decrease the resolution of the leaves? Then I can use the mesh resolution slider and decrease this to minus one and this will unsubdivide the plant once, minus two twice, etc. So it's uh, really easy to um, modify the amount of polygons for each plant part individually. Okay, so um, how can we now shape this into a proper leaf? Um, well, first we should adjust the width of the leaf. Um, before we do this, we need to um, tell TPF how we would like to work with this plane. By default, TPF assumes that we're only modifying um, one half of the, pla of the plane, so for example the left side, and whatever we do here will will be mirrored over to the right side. So this is what happens when symmetrical is active. Personally, I'd like to work um, on the entire width, so let's change this to full width. Okay, so the leaves are still a little bit too wide because they are going to be pretty narrow. I mean, they have to match the, the diameter of the stem after all. So let's decrease um, the width um, to a smaller value, for example, 0 0.4, maybe 0 0.42, and let's add a bit of variation, 0 0.1. Okay, 
Um, now we have this section filter here. This section represents well <laughs> the section of um, the the leaf. So right now it's totally flat. So let's switch to our curve again and let's fold the sleeve. You can already see what's going to happen. Whatever I do here is going to be reflected um, in the leaves. So I'll simply um, use shape like this maybe and let's adjust the curves a little bit. Okay, and I'll go back to the transform tab and set the resolution back to zero so that it looks a little bit more rounded and not that low polygon. Of course, the filter uh, acts way too strongly at the moment. So I'll go back to the segment tab and to the blades group. And here we can now um, set the height of the filter. Maybe 0.4 will do it. Uh, that's n still too strong. 0.2. Yeah. That looks good to me. Um, let's turn the wireframe display off and the highlighting so that we can see the leaf better. Okay, so the, the, the second thing that you can do now is um, instead of using an alpha map, an alpha map for um, creating the outer shape of our um, leaf, we can actually create this shape um, as real 3D geometry. So for this purpose, let's use the profile filter and let's open this one. Once again, this is the top of the leaf and this is the bottom. And let's move this down. I'll just activate snapping so that it snaps at zero. And you can already see um, how the leaf shape adapts to the shape that I create here. So let's make this a little bit more rounded. Maybe like this. Yep, that looks good. Okay, and finally, um, the width at the beginning is, is a little bit too uh, strong. So um, we should y um, adjust this, uh, the, the width of the blade along the length as well. So let's start with um, the orange curve for the blade width and set this one to zero at the very beginning. And yeah, maybe like this. I'm not sure if I'm satisfied. Mm. Yeah, I think that's okay for our purposes. We're going to modify the leaf even further. Um, about the z-axis, I think you can change the setting in the options. Let me see. Default rotation order. Yeah, I think you can um, simply cha uh, change this to another order, which would be X, Z, Y probably. And then um, it should be fit for exporting to other applications. Okay, so we now have a real um, 3D leaf with a lot of depth. Um, yes, uh, about the texturing, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, we still haven't adjusted the texture for the leaves. Um, before we adjust the texture, I would like to um, first uh, model the geometry. Okay, so once again, I would like to curl the leaves as well. So let's go back to the leaves node and to the influences tab and to the bias tab. And let's switch the type to curl. And this is a little bit too strong in my opinion. So I would like to use a curl of 0.4 maybe, sorry, 0.4 not 4 plus minus 0.25 
and once again um, I would like the curl not to be that strong in the very beginning so let's use that filter and what are we going to do? Probably something like this. Yeah, and now we have um, the full strength of the curl at the tip of the leaf and less curl at the beginning. And I'd also make this a little bit more gnarly, so I'm going to add a second local bias. And this time I would like to twist the leaf to make it uh, like a real wildflower. And uh, now we already have a twisted leaf. And that looks pretty good to me. Um, maybe let's adjust the, the strength a little bit. 0.75 and point, I don't know, plus um, 4 maybe. And there we are. Okay, so I think the leaves look fine. Now back to the material. Um, when you were asking about whether that stretched the textures, um, what exactly were you referring to about stretching? Um, yes, the texturing is UV based. Um, I'm now on the materials tab of um, the the leaves node and there's a dedicated um, texture mapping group for the blades that we just activated here so we were working with blades and here you can um, once again set the U and V tiling and you can also specify um, on the other side uh, on the other tab sorry um, whether this uh, filter should also cut away uh, the, UV, the UVs or not. I think this is the pinching parameter, um, but I'm not sure. I would have to look that up in the manual, to be honest. But yes, it is UV-based, and generally speaking, you can um, you can um, use this uh, on the blades tab. Um, yeah, uh, Uwe, you're right. I could also have used... Um, the tropism parameter. So in TPF there are um, a lot of settings that work uh, very similarly. For example, you have a tropism parameter which is to be found right here. So Uwe was asking whether um, I uh, could use the tropism parameter instead of the curl and of course I could. It would work um, exactly the same way. Um, the only difference being that uh, tropism will always curl um, the plant up and down and uh, with uh, this setting you can specify the axis along which the plant will be curled. So ha you have a little bit more flexibility here. Okay, good. Um, so uh, finally we simply need to adjust uh, where our leaves will grow and then our plant is basically done. So let's get back to the parent tab and go to the grass seeds. And um, now we're going to adjust where our leaves are going to grow. So first I would like to increase the number of leaves. Um, four are um, not enough in my opinion. Sorry, I'm on the wrong tab. That's the right one. So let's increase this to eight plus minus two maybe. <coughs> and... Um, what else would I like to adjust? Let me think about it. Um, I would like to adjust where the leaves are allowed to end regarding growing because at the moment they grow all the way up to the very top of the stem and I'd rather like to limit them to the bottom 50%. So for this I have the ending parameter. So let's reduce the ending to something like this maybe and introduce a little bit of variation you can see that uh, the leaves all move down because um, they are not allowed to grow in the upper 33% of um, the, the stem length and what else let me see 
Um, I'd like to adjust um, the growth angle. I'd like to make them um, point more towards the sky. So let's increase the angle to something like this. And let's add some variation. And so about um, this parameter, that's something that I wanted to show you as well. It's called the Horal parameter. And by clicking Horal, um, we can have several um, children grow at from the same point around the circumference of the plant. So I'll simply click Horal and let's say per Horal 1.4 plus minus 0 0.0. The reason being um, TPF always uh, 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 rounds the number so if we go up above 1.5 this is considered as two instances so by using 1.4 and adding a variation of 0 0.2 um, we arrive between one instance and two instances so it's rounded up or down and finally um, the arrangement of the leaves is still pretty rectangular uh, regular sorry and for this um, there's a final parameter that I would like to use and that's the coil parameter and so let's use a coil of 50. So a coil is going to um, spin spin the leaves around in a spiral way around the length. So I can show this to you by manipulating this parameter interactively. You can see how the leaves are starting to spin around. So imagine having a spiral staircase and the leaves um, are the staircase. So I think that's a good um, representation. Okay, and our grass plant is done. Um, there's one last thing that I would like to do and this is to create a bunch of grass plants. So for this uh, we need one final node that itself does not create any geometry but that does multiply everything that is connected to it and distributed in the scene. So um, for this let's add a um, Hydra um, node. Of course I can always use the toolbar on the left or I can do a right click go to geometry and select whatever I want and in this case I would like to have a Hydra. So I'll connect this Hydra to the root as well and nothing's happening because Hydra itself does not generate any geometry. It's a multiplication node. So let's connect our stem to the Hydra let's see what happens. So we now have um, two connections to the root node so please note that you can, uh, can connect multiple um, plants to the root node so we have one in the middle of the scene and we have 12 uh, copies of the plant each being unique scattered around in a circle. So um, I think we need to decrease the number of plants a little bit so let's go with six plus minus five so that we also get a lot of variation between uh, the amount of plants. Your screen is stuck. Okay, what about the others? We're I think it's almost just done. Bite factory 3D. Just, it's okay. just Bite Factory 3D. So come, come out and come back in again. Okay. Works for all uh, others? Okay. So um, we're basically done. So just like uh, 10 mi more minutes. Um, yeah, so uh, w I just reduced the number of children and uh, now let's uh, increase the radius of the spreading of the copies. So let's increase the radius to four centimeters. So this moved the copies away from each other, maybe plus minus 1.5. And um, the scale of every plant is identical, but um, let's add a little bit of variation to that one as well, plus minus uh, 15. And now we, um, of course, need to um, make the plants point up. So let's use the first angle, which is the X angle, I believe. And something like this, um, with a little bit of variation. And let's use a little bit of variation in the other angles as well. And there we are. 
So we just finished our grass plant. This is what it looks like. And we can now give it a try and create a couple of new variations by clicking this button here. Um, the uh, amount of polygons is very high, so let's unsubdivide the plant. Subdivide less. Yeah, so uh, we ha still have the same plant, but with only 15,000 instead of 500,000 polygons. And the generation is now a lot faster when we click this button for a new instance. So this is what it looks like, and this is our finished plant. Um, I'm going to save this as a scene. And we are done. Um, so are there any questions? I see the one about intersecting polygons. Um, yes, Plant Factory does not have collision detection, unfortunately. Um, um, I once asked Eon about it and they told me that they had tried to implement it, um, but it was so calculation intensive that they decided to reduce it in the end because the software became totally unresponsive. So um, yes, uh, you are, um, you basically have to rely on the random seed number and there can be overlapping polygons. Any more questions? If not, then I will turn to the final topic for today, which is exporting this plant to other applications, um, to both VU and uh, other software. Okay, so, um, then I'll move on. Okay, so now we have this uh, plant. I would like to include a few um, var variations for selection in Vue as well. So let's flag this variation and create two or three more. Um, Anthony, Anthony um, Nelson is requesting um, remote control. Is that a, um, a mistake? Decline. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a mistake okay. there. Just okay. Fine, no, no problem. <laughs> no problem, Anthony. I just wanted to ask. Um, okay, so let's add another variation. And maybe this one as well. And this one as well. And one final one. Okay, let's see. Yeah, we have five... Um, uh, variations right now, which will be accessible in Vue. So let's save this again. And so about exporting, um, you go to File, Export, and if you want to export it to other applications, you go to Export as Mesh. So there are a couple of export presets in here, which only contain um, fitting options for um, every um, other 3D application. So uh, the export formats that you have are 3DS, Alembic with two different versions, um, the native Cinema 4D format, uh, Collider, FBX, um, GeoZ, which I mentioned earlier for um, sculpting uh, plant parts directly in ZBrush, native Lightwave uh, export format and OBJ. So when you uh, select FBX, for example, um, uh, these ex uh, export options uh, are turn ac turning active. So first you can adjust the access system for exporting and um, reverse Z and Y, for example, which was one of the questions uh, a few minutes ago. You can also choose to include the plant position in the scene um, and you can uh, select whether you want um, also the level of details to be exported as separ separate files, which again is something that we're going to deal with tomorrow. You can select whether you want uh, one single polygon mesh or one part per node or, or child position. And in case um, your plant has a wind animation built in, which we didn't do right now, you can also um, check apply wind and this will include the deformation of the plant uh, when wind is blowing on it uh, when you export it as, an, as a 3D mesh. Um, regarding the textures, you can um, either export regular texture maps or you can also export them per face, so 
per polygon um, as p tags maps. Um, optionally, you can invert uh, the alpha channel um, for exporting the alpha textures. This, of course, depends on uh, whether your target application um, considers black uh, as transparent or white. And um, you can also apply gamma correction and ask whether uh, set whether your texture map format is supposed to be in, in a specific format or if you want to use the original format that you load into TPF. Um, regarding the triangles and quads, this um, is set in the plant uh, uh, parameters uh, itself. So right here under the meshing tab, and here you can select between triangles, quads, or a mixture. And um, we're going to dive into that tomorrow as well. So whatever you set here will be the, the um, export setting for um, here, for your other application. And so um, let's just switch back to um, FBX. Uh, if your plant is animated, you can select whether you want the animation to be exported with um, uh, pre-animated bones or whether you don't want the animation to be exported but you still want to include the bones within the plants for manual rigging in your software or you can also export it as an animated point cloud. Um, beware though that animated point clouds um, are huge amounts of data and they will quickly um, yeah, generate gigabytes that uh, can uh, bug down your hard drive. And finally, uh, for SP FBX at least, you can um, optimize the uh, material options for the different uh, render settings in Maya and 3ds Max for the different render engines. And uh, so just to show it to you, I'll select Cinema 4D as a preset because that's the only software that I uh, have uh, regarding general 3D. So let's export this to uh, Cinema 3D as grass finished, maybe, finished grass. And click OK. So since this plant is pretty small, export's working quickly. And I'll simply start up Cinema 4D. You can see that all the texture maps were also exported. And uh, let's open the scene file and zoom onto the uh, geometry and there we are. Our plan's been exported to Cinema 4D with all polygons intact and all the texture mapping intact. We can even do a test render. So that's how you export it to other applications and if you want to get, get the plan for example into Unreal or Unity just use the FBX export and check um, export level of details as well and then you get your four different level of detail plans that you can then import into Unreal, for example, and um, link them all um, to a different level of detail object. Any questions regarding the export to other applications? Nope? Okay. Then for the final step today, let's just export this plan to Vue. And before we do that, I'd like to show you one final incredibly cool feature. Let's go back to the parameters of the Hydra object. By clicking on the name of any setting in any node, you can select Publish Parameter. And you can uh, give this parameter a number, for example, number of grass plants. And if I now click Allow External Access, this parameter will be available in Vue's plant editor. So I'll click OK and I'll go to File, Export, Export to Vue as a species. So we're do we want to save the uh, procedural file format, not a static polygon object. So species. Grass finished, that looks good. All the textures and dependencies will be uh, included in the file, so no need to worry about that. TPF will generate a preview and click OK. So now let's start up Vue. And I'm going to load the plant into Vue. Um, 
grass, grass finished. There it is. Um, this triangle is the wind triangle, so um, Vue users might know this triangle. You can uh, move this to um, bend the plant under a strong wind influence. Since we didn't include wind settings um, in our plant, this is not going to have any effect if we move it. But once again, we're going to touch upon this tomorrow. Um, so this is our plant in Vue. And if we double click it, we are in our plant editor. And for one, if we click here, we get all of the variations that we saved within TPF and can load them with one single mouse click. And second, the number that we just um, published from the Hydra node is now available in Vue. So I can uh, set this to 20 and now we uh, have 20 grass plants in here or maybe just one. So just um, don't be confused, be, uh, since there are still more plants uh, visible, the variation that I indicated here is not um, accessible in Vue. Uh, oh, sorry, it is. There. I just turn, turned the um, variation off, and now we're really stuck with one plant in the middle and one plant from the Hydra object. If I set this to zero, we should end up with one plant. So this way you can uh, create an arbitrary amount of controls that can directly be um, accessed by the user inside Vue. And also you can check allow use of smaller level of details. So in case the plant has built in level of details, um, Vue will make use of these uh, uh, level of details for plants that are further away from the camera. And also one um, incredibly cool thing is um, if you purchase a plant, for example, on Cornucopia, or if you use an own, uh, your own plant, um, and you own Plant Factory, uh, this icon will be present in the plant editor. And you can click this icon. And, oh, sorry, I first need to close Plant Factory. Okay, and I can now click this icon. Hmm, plant Factory is still running. Let's give it another try. Yep. Okay. So I click this icon and now Plant Factory is starting up again and it's loading this plant that I just have with this exact variation um, of the plant into Vue. And I can now remove the variation for example and let's say I would like this plant to be a lot longer. Let's make this a really, really long stem. I just modified this plant. I can now click this icon, Apply to Vue. Vue is now blinking. And the changes that we just made in Plant Factory, and we can now close Plant Factory, were directly applied and transferred to Vue. And we now have um, a very long um, version of this plant in our scene. And uh, the second integration that I would like to show you, and this is the final topic of today, is the ecosystem integration. So let's load this plant into an ecosystem, the finished grass. And Vue tells you that by default, the, uh, the quality of the TPF plant is set to static mesh, because this is the most efficient for um, your RAM, your memory. And so Vue is now generating variations of the species and by default it generates three variations. You can indicate the amount of variations by clicking on here and since we um, saved um, these variations within the plant, we flagged them, we can even select uh, which of our flagged variations we would like to include um, for the ecosystem population. So let's select all of them. And this is a new feature of VU and TPF 2016 by the way. And if I now click on the item settings, I can select the um, quality for the plant. So um, by default, it's set to static, as Vu just told us. I can also uh, increase or decrease the subdivision, the amount of polygons for the ecosystem. And let's uh, uh, set this to static. Let's paint a single instance and see what happens. So I just painted a single instance 
and now I'm going to convert the single instance to a real object. Convert to objects. Hmm. If we want to convert it. Um, I think it works in all versions. I'm using Xtreme, but um, as long as you have the Botanica module and the EcoPainter module, it should work in all versions. Right, Barry? Can you confirm That's this? correct, yep. Yep, yep. If you have the okay. uh, correct module, yeah. Okay. So I just um, moved this instance out of the population and made it a real um, object. And since it was... Uh, uh, since it was uh, set to static, we can now see that static means the object will be baked into polygons. So uh, with static objects, um, the plants cannot react to wind, uh, for example, in the scene. Let's paint another instance here and select this one as well. And this time we're setting the uh, type to procedural. And once again, oh, TPF is regenerating the plant. Once again, I'll select the plant and manipulate, convert it to an object. Now we end up with a normal plant object in, in, in uh, Vue that we can uh, uh, manipulate in the plant editor. And finally, the last available option, let's paint a third instance. The last available option is animated mesh. So in case this had built-in wind animation, we could now set an animation duration, for example, 5 seconds with 25 frames per second. And this uh, will bake the um, object into an animated mesh. And Vu crashed. <laughs> but um, if we moved that one out of the population, we would uh, see that uh, what we ended up with was a animated baked polygon mesh for our plan. So these are the integration options uh, inside Vu. And um, that's what I wanted to show you today as an in-depth introduction to the very basics of Plant Factory. And to give you an outlook um, of what we're going to do tomorrow, um, I'll walk you through either one or several projects, depending on the time. And within these projects, we'll uh, be creating advanced dependencies. So we'll be um, ma we'll make settings of a node depend on set on other settings of the same or or another node. We'll have a look at wind animation and bone creation, and how you can create plants with age, health, and season. And I'll show you other modeling approaches rather than um, linking one node to another. Um, there's uh, an, another approach with iteration and the growth nodes. And finally, we'll also take a detailed look at the meshing options for triangles, quads, and manual and automatic uh, um, meshing and level of details. Um, Do you want to give a, to give a quick yep. taste to... Um one of the projects we might be looking at tomorrow just to whet people's appetites. Um, and, uh, yes, however, I'm not sure whether I will show this project uh, tomorrow because it's really taxing, um, but I can give you a look <laughs> nonetheless. Um, sneak peek. A sneak peek, yep. So once this is loaded, yes, okay. Um, so this is not necessarily a real birch tree regarding the growth shape of the tree. Um, I was simply playing around and I had some birch textures and leaves lying around and I applied them. So this might not be a botanically correct birch tree, but yes, this is one of the possible projects for tomorrow on how to build um, a fully animated a tree and in this case I simply used uh, birch leaves and yeah so one of the possible prospects another one yeah. uh, would be a palm tree which I will probably show um, in any case tomorrow because that one's pretty interesting all right so a couple of last questions in the chat box uh, did we cover okay. eBay? Yeah, so uh, Uwe is asking whether um, you can select the amount of variations within the ecosystem 
um, if you haven't saved variations with this button in TPF. Yes, that's possible. So um, if you are in Vue and you click on the number of variations, um, a pop-up box will appear where we can enter the number of variations that plan fact, uh, sorry, Vue will generate. Um, but this only uh, happens when no variation is flagged here. So in case you flag variations for your plant, you cannot exceed the, the uh, amount of flagged variations. If I flag five variations of this plant, I cannot more ca generate more than these five variations in Vue. So it's either or. Either flagged variations with a limited amount or uh, unlimited amount of variations but with no predefined variations. And so about the Hydra node, um, yes, you can add uh, the Hydra node to the seeds as well. So you were uh, referring um, to, let me go back to the scene file, you're referring to multiplying the amount of seeds on top of the stem, right? Okay, um, actually you don't even need a Hydra node for this. Um, let's go back to the stem tab and to the grass seeds tab. Um, so I changed the placement for this instance to tip of the segment. And if I now check the horal parameter, I can um, place more than one seed on top of the uh, stem. Let's enter five, uh, sorry here, five plus minus zero. And there we are, we just um, added five, five uh, times the uh, grass seeds warp board to the top of the stem. Okay. Um, okay, so you're asking about the season model. Um, I'm not going to explain every working of the gra uh, graph because this would um, be too long and too complicated for um, a webinar. But I will touch upon um, the creation of uh, seasonal control tomorrow. Um, so maybe that's the one you were referring to. Um, yeah, so these are meta nodes within meta nodes within meta nodes. So it's indeed very complicated. But um, I, as I said, I will give you the general idea on how to work with the season tomorrow. And to give you another example, this is one of the example plants that I did for uh, Plant Factory 2015. That one was modeled by me. And um, the crocus is also a very, very complex plant. Um, so with the crocus, I um, made the plant compatible with age and health. So um, for example, you can make the plant grow from a seedling into the full, fully blown plant. And you can also make it die or fully thrive at any stage of the game at any age and there are also um, quite a lot of controls if we go to the presets tab which is also something we'll cover tomorrow I built a couple of presets so that you can influence um, the number of uh, the amount of leaves that are included around the plant and you can also uh, switch the textures uh, in a drop down menu uh, with the single click of a mouse button so it's really possible to build very elaborate um, graphs in Plant Factory. And the graph uh, doesn't look too complicated, but if I simply unfold one of the group meta nodes, this is what it looks like. And I can keep on unfolding meta node after meta node after meta node. And the graph will progressively get a lot more complex. So that's the reason why I cannot cover every uh, seasonal setting um, in in the webinar, but I will uh, try my very best to give you <laughs> a basic idea on on, <laughs> on how things work. So I could <laughs> keep we're expanding the notes. Up. We're going to need to wrap up now, but yep. um, I, I think I'd, what I'd love to know is for those of you that haven't seen plant factory before are you completely astonished by the amount of con control you can have over building these stems and leaves because that's what took me aback it was just 
um, amazing to see um, how much thought has gone into the software and how much control you can have over each part of the these plants. Yeah, Greg says astonished and amazed. So yeah, so we'll see some more of this tomorrow. We're, we're yep. starting at the same time. So I'm going to go back to my slides now. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. Yeah. yeah. And I'll just um, confirm the fact that uh, tomorrow we're starting at the same time. We're releasing the HD recordings um, within 48 hours, but I'll, I'll probably start rendering the and editing the recording tonight, so you'll get part one uh, maybe by tomorrow. I also recorded the webinar on my end as well, and I'll upload uh, my uh, raw recordings to you as well, Paul, so you can use the one with yeah. uh, better quality. That's right, so that, that'd be a better, better frame rate for everyone, so you'll, get, you'll end up with two sets of recordings. Okay, so um, please thank Daniel today. I think he's done a superb job. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. The best TPF session I've ever seen. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see hopefully most of you tomorrow.